If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. As you turn there, uh, just thinking about the Olympics, if you didn't know, the Olympics came and went. They were uh, July 26th through August 11th, just two weeks ago it ended. And so uh, the USA, just give you a recap if you didn't watch it or didn't see it. Uh, the USA had a 126 medals, 40 of which were gold. And just give you kind of what I would say are some of the highlights is Steph Curry there on the left. Uh, just went lights out, uh, kind of secured his place as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Didn't say the greatest, but one of the greatest. That was just unreal, pretty good. Uh, then there's Simone Biles, who uh, is, the, is the greatest American gymnast of all time, 11 medals. That's pretty amazing. And if you didn't see, uh, there was also a, a break dancer from Australia. So that was something that happened that some of you might know about. Last time the Olympics were in Paris was 100 years ago, 1924, and there was an athlete named Eric Little. Uh, Lydell, I'm sorry, a British guy. There's a movie made after it. It's called Chariot of Fire. And uh, he ran the 100-meter dash, but they were going to run that race on a Sunday. And he said, I, I want to honor the Sabbath day. I'm not going to run on a Sunday. I think that was 100 years ago. Man, how times have changed. He said, I wouldn't run on a Sunday. So instead, he ran the 400-meter dash. If you've seen the movie, there's a line that says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. That's actually from an actor. That's not actually his quote. His quote was, uh, they said, how do you run the 400 meter? And he really was kind of the first guy who tried to sprint the entire 400 meter instead of really pacing himself. And uh, he said, well, I run the first 200 meters as fast as I can. Then I ask God to help me run the second 200 meters faster. And so that was kind of his quote. So just a great competitor. If you know much about the Olympics, they, the Olympics lasted from um, this Mahomes. Yeah, that's somebody is a Mahomes fan here. FYI, the, the, the whole thing with the Olympics is to see who is the best. There's 400 different, uh, different events that are happening at the Olympics now, and so uh, next year, they're going to add flag football. So, of course, all these NFL players said, I would love to play on the USA flag football team, and uh, so there's this man right here. His name is uh, Daryl. Doucette, and he said he's actually a professional flag football player, which means I think they play on the weekend. And so he said, I think it's kind of audacious of the NFL players to just assume that they're better than us. And really, that's the whole heart of the Olympics. And so just to give you uh, some stats that he has, he's 5'8 and 140 pounds. And this week, he said that he thinks he's better at flag football than Patrick Mahomes. So I, I just, that's funny, I think. <laughs> I mean, maybe if we said Josh Allen or if we said Burrow or somebody, yeah, maybe. <laughs> just, <laughs> just just Miss <laughs> Vic, walk on, thin ice. Okay, got it. Um, just thinking about what that's like when, you know, for somebody to make that claim, uh, I, I might say that I'm better than Patrick Mahomes at flag football. That would all be laughable. Well, I wanted to ask you this, 400 Olymp, uh, Olympic events, if I were to ask you, man, let's just blow that up. It doesn't have to be the 400. It could be anything that you dream of but you could say, I'd be the best at this. What would you want to be the best at? If, you, if we were to say, man, we, we had the, you could pray today, Lord, make me the best at, and he was gonna answer the prayer, what would be the thing you would say, I want to be the best at this? And really, whenever we're looking at this passage, here's what Paul is going to, uh, to encourage the Corinthians at, is this. I wonder if we ask that question, you could be the best at anything. Is there anyone in the room who would say, you know what I would love to be the best at? I would love to be the best at giving. I mean, wouldn't that be great, man, if, if the gift that I had, if there was some type of Olympic award medal that was given to the best giver, and that's ultimately what Paul tells them in verse seven. He says this, as you excel in everything, in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, in the complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see to it also that you excel in your grace of giving. Now think of this, of all the things that, that we would be uh, condemned for, that scripture would say, don't do these things, did you know we've never been condemned for trying to be great at something? In fact, a, a, a sermon that blessed my heart several years ago, someone sent to me from Luke 22. It's whenever the disciples were asking Jesus who the best was, that Jesus doesn't actually condemn them for that statement. Instead, he shows them how to be the best. That's in Luke 22. And it's, he doesn't condemn them for that. Instead, he says, here's how you could be the best. I, I would tell you this today. Being the best at giving is not based in comparison to anyone else. It's compared with what you do in your own heart and how you give. You could actually be the best giver in the world. Isn't that great? 
You could have the ability to be best at something. Now, I have to tell you, I'm always nervous whenever somebody begins to talk about giving. And let me clarify before we dive in why we're talking about this. There's some of you that it's your first Sunday. So, man, you could walk away saying, I went to church one time and all they did was talk about money. And that's going to be true today. So, there you go. So, let me tell you why uh, I'm talking about giving here. The reason is it's the next passage. We're doing kind of an overview of the book of Corinthians, and so it's the next topic, and so we're going to talk about it. I would actually say that in our church, this has been the best year of giving that we've had. So I'm not preaching because we're in some dire need and I'm trying to drum up money. I'm honestly just preaching because it is the next passage, but I would tell you this, when God is at work in our hearts, he's also at work in our wallets. And so there's just a truth there. So I think God is doing a great work in our church, and I believe it's being reflected in your generosity. So I just want to begin with by saying thank you. Now that that's said, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, would you stand in the honor of reading God's Word? We're going to read chapter 8, 1 through 12. Then we're going to jump into chapter 9 and read 6 through 11. So If you'll read with me, it says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflow of joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the saints, And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I am... I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, his, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is here, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Now jump to chapter 9, verse 6, if you will, with me. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, in all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will also supply an increase in your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for allowing us to gather today and to read your word. Father, I thank you for your generosity, for giving your son. Father, I thank you that there's not a person here who hasn't received the gift of breath today. You've also given us a gift of free choice of whether we would respond with these, with each breath to praise you. Father, I pray for those who don't know you yet, that today you draw them to salvation. And Father, for those who do know you, Father, I ask that you would draw them to a generous lifestyle. Father, I ask that you do that in my heart as well. Lord, we love you and I thank you for the way you work. I thank you for the way you've been at work. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, here's what we're talking about is how to be the best. What's happened in the Corinthian church is they're in great need of revival because they've settled into, we're okay. They've settled into complacency. It's one thing to, to, you know, we kind of laugh, make it a joke for this guy to say, I think I'm better than Patrick Mahomes, but at least he has an ambition. 
How many of us have, instead of ambition, just settled into complacency and say, this is about where I am, this is who I am. I'm in my 40s. We call that a midlife crisis often whenever somebody's in their 40s and they just say, there's got to be something more. There should be something in, in believers saying, we desire more and more for the glory of God. So here is how to be the best at generosity. Here's point number one. You should have a role model. You should have somebody that you look up to that you'd say, this is a person that I could model my life after. This is why we often elevate athletes. Now, this is kind of interesting in the church because we don't often say, I'd like to bring up our best tither, put them right here in front of everybody, and then brag on what God is doing through them. We'd all think that's odd, isn't it? But that's exactly what Paul does here. He says, I want to brag on the Macedonian church. He says, let me, let me just tell you a couple things that the Macedonian church did. Number one, they gave themselves first to the Lord. This is why I'm always nervous talking about Uh, money, because what I want you to hear, if there's anything I want you to walk away from the church knowing, it's that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And I'd have you know, if you've never trusted Christ, the main thing that God wants you to hear today is that he gave his son so that you may have life through him. What God wants from you primarily is your life. And this is the first thing that Paul brags about. He says, first of all, what they did was they gave themselves to the Lord. This is what they wanted. They wanted the Lord more than anything. The last thing I want is for you to say, oh man, here's this mob of people that are just mesmerized by the mooch up here talking about money. Instead, what you need to hear is that Jesus Christ saved sinners. Amen, that's great news. So that's the first thing he says. He points to that. I, we had baptism this morning. I heard the story of a man who uh, had given Christ his life, and so he was supposed to get baptized. So like we do here at our church, I, I met with the people who are getting baptized before Sunday school, before Bible study, and just said, hey, here's what baptism looks like. You'll put your knees here. I'll put my hand here, and this is kind of what it will look like. And we often say, now be sure to wear like a dark shirt or something that you can get baptized in. And this man showed up to be baptized, and he showed up in his business suit. He was a very successful businessman, and, and so the pastor said, no, you can go change during this song, and we'll do the baptism. And he said, this is what I'm getting baptized in. And this was a very high-dollar suit, and the pastor said, well, you know, you could, you could change. We actually have some T-shirts with our logo on it. And the man said, no, I don't want to just get my Sunday life baptized. I want to get my Monday through Friday and my Saturday baptized as well. I want to be baptized with all of me. I want to show that I've given Christ authority over all of me. The Macedonians were lifted up first as an example to say they gave themselves first to Christ before they were concerned about money. If you hear this and say, what we're asking for is your money, you've missed the point. What God is asking for is your heart. But your heart is often very connected to your wallet. Grace not only frees us from our sins, but it also frees us from ourselves. The grace of God will open your heart and your hand. Your giving is not the result of calculation, but the result of a celebration. To say, as a new person, you want to give to him. Secondly, he says they gave to the will of God. He's talking about how they wanted to join in the support. The Macedonians were saying, whoa, whoa, Paul, you mean you travel around and tell other people about Jesus? Well, man, could we give to that? I mean, we, we want to help you on that deal. There's a reason why you would want to give. The motivation is to say God has a mission. The mission is that every person, every place, every tribe, every tongue would hear about the name of Jesus because it's the only name that saves. And so they're excited to give towards the will of God. Now, what we do in our church, we started this a couple years ago, is that we, we said every time we're going to take an offering, we want to celebrate something. So it might seem like a commercial for some of you. You might hear it and be like, oh, here's another big pitch of why we should give. But that's not the point at all. The reason that we started it was because there was a parent that came to me who said their kid had asked, what do we do with the money? And the parent said, I wasn't sure how to answer that, so I brought my kid to you. And really, it was convicting to me to think, here's a parent who doesn't know what we do with the money because they couldn't answer for their kid. So every week, I want to tell you, here's what we do with the money that you give. We invest in the mission of God. So think, just what a cool deal this is. Whenever you give, you have an opportunity to give to Germany, to the people that we just saw right here, the Schistlers that are, that are serving the Lord. You get to give towards people who are serving in the Middle East and around the world. And tomorrow, I'm going to go with one of our dear brothers, and there's a lady who just injured her foot, and I think she's an unbeliever. And he said, hey, could you go with me tomorrow and help build her a ramp into her house? How cool is that? Your money will, will help give towards that, that we get to minister to. Isn't this great? You don't seem to be too excited. But here's what the Macedonian people were doing. Paul kind of brings them up on stage and says, look at this example. 
They've got a role model to say, wow, they gave of themselves first to the Lord. And then they gave financially to the will. And then third, he says they were eager. Look at verse three and four. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us the privilege of sharing in the service of the saints. I've been here seven years. And, and there have been people that have come to me in seven years and said, hey, Brother Jared, we, could we start doing this song? Um, I really like this song. Somebody this morning said, hey, I really like this song. Could we start doing it? Uh, somebody else came to me not long ago and said, hey, what do you think about a Sunday night service? What would, if we could start doing that. Can I tell you something nobody's come to me and said? Hey, you think we could do a second offering? I mean, <laughs> could, we just, could we just run it back one more time? Maybe end with an offering as well, send the plates back by? Nobody's ever said that. Here's what they said. They pretty much are like, Paul, 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 don't leave. We want to give an offering. You know, we're going to do a, a revival uh, here in a couple weeks, and and I, I haven't asked anybody, so please forgive me. Man, what would you think about doing a love offering? When's the last time our church just said, well, this is just a love offering? We're gonna bring somebody in who I believe the Lord is using. I believe he's a man of God. I, I don't know anybody else's heart, but he'll preach. And I'd love to say, man, let's just invest in that dude's ministry. And that'd be great. I mean, we've got a budget. We've already set aside money from previous year's giving and this year's giving and said, here's what we'll do. And we'll do this, you know, rent the tent and all that. But I mean, shouldn't we be saying, Dude, man, this guy looks like good investment, this guy seems to love the Lord. Let's give towards his ministry. When a church, there are some churches that have plenty of money, but lack to seem to, seem to have the spirit moving. They've got a large savings account, but no move of the spirit. But when a, church, when a church is not spiritual, they're not generous. But whenever a church has got the spirit of God moving, it's also moving in their hearts to say, let's give towards the mission. And I believe that's part of what's happening in our church. We, we have great giving this year. Uh, and then here's last, the last thing that he says about the Macedonians. They gave even when it was hard to give. Look at verse two. Out of the most severe trial and their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. I'd ask you, who's the person you look up to as a giver? I don't know what anyone here gives. I've never known that. At the last church I pastored, I never knew that. But I could tell you there was a man named Terry Nutty, and I believe I've told about him before. He was kind of the town drunk, and somebody, we were doing a revival, and the revival preacher said, you'll see a great movement when the worst man in your community comes to Christ. We're driving down the road, I kid you not, and I said, that's the man. He's got several women pregnant, left them with their children. He's kind of a drunkard, and it won't go into all Terry's story, but I said, that's him. And I mean, it wasn't right after I said it, Terry raised his thumb up. And I said, let's pick him up. And he jumps in and, and we get to share the gospel with him. Terry trusted Christ. Terry had no electricity. He was living in an old trailer that he had inherited from his parents who had passed away. He had no electricity, no running water. He seriously drank water out of Buffalo Creek. The, the church was named after the creek that we were next to. That's where he got his drinking water. And there was one time it rained a lot, and I knew he had a hole in his roof. And I said, Terry, what, what did you do with all the rain? I know your house is leaking. He said, it was simple. I cut a hole in the floor. Just let the water drop in and fall on out. You know, it's not rocket science, man. <laughs> like, what would you do? Just let it puddle up? What an idiot. Man, Terry was a giver. weird to see somebody who has nothing probably the poorest person i know apart from being homeless man that dude wanted to give and how self-righteous am i let me just tell you in my mind i thought terry save that up dude fix that roof like get you a couch that doesn't smell you, you know like you get some plumbing in here you know if you don't have running water you also don't have plumbing just let your mind roll with that for a little bit and Terry's saying, no, no, I want to give. Man, what a role model. He was a mentor. Here's a quote I read this week. God sees not only the portion, but the proportion. If we could have given more and did not, God notices. If we wanted to give more but could not, God also notices. When we give willingly according to what we have, we're practicing grace giving. Man, there's some people in the church, I have no clue what anybody gives, but I could tell you by the way they live, man, they're generous. You, you, you ought to maybe talk to them. 
have a conversation with them. That's number one. You want to be great, have a role model, somebody that, that kind of sets the stage of here's the direction to run it. Number two, you're going to have to set some challenging goals for yourself. You're going to have to, to say, okay, if I'm going to be great at this, what are some goals that I would have? Here's goal number one. Begin in praying that God would grow your desire to give. Here's what he says in verse 10 of chapter 8. And here is my advice about what is best for you in the matter. Last year, you were first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work with your eager willingness to do may be matched by your completion of it. I think maybe if you're saying, you know what, God's called me to give, but I don't really feel it. And scripture here says, be a cheerful giver. And if I'm not cheerful, man, last thing I'd want to do is offend the Lord. So I'll just not give. That's not how it works. What you could do is say, Lord, would you change my heart? Would you, would you make me a cheerful giver? Would I be excited about it? It's actually interesting. The word cheerful there, go, that's jumping up to, to chapter nine, talking about being a cheerful giver. Uh, that's verse seven. God loves a cheerful giver. That word actually means to laugh. It, it means to laugh as you give. Now, I was thinking about this, and really, I didn't have a point for it until right before the service. And as I was walking out of my office door to come into the sanctuary, I was reminded, I believe, by the Holy Spirit of a verse about laughing. It's Proverbs 31, about the the righteous woman, right? And what does it say? She laughs with no fear of tomorrow. There is an element of giving where you say, Lord, I want to be so cheerful, so excited about giving that I'm not worried about tomorrow. And we'll get into that about what God does. That'll be the third point. I don't mean to jump a- ahead of myself, but we could ask, Lord, would you, would you create in me a desire to be generous? We have a real giving problem. Some people are too proud to give and others are too proud to receive. And I have to tell you, I'm often too proud to receive. Just like the story I told you with Terry, I got to preach in a little town called Holt, Missouri one time, almost 20 years ago now. Preached at this a little church. I don't even remember the name of it, but it was in Holt, Missouri. And there was a man at the end of the service who came up to me and said, uh, it was one of those times where I feel like the Lord really moved. And he said, man, I've never heard preaching like that. And I want to do something for you. I want to give something to you. And I said, oh no, you know, man, the church gave me an offering. And, and he was being so like overwhelmingly kind and I didn't know what to do with it. So I just kept like turning it down, like, hey, no, you know, man, they paid, they, they gave me gas money, they're gonna take me out to lunch, we're gonna eat Mexican, it's gonna be great, you know, like, I just kept turning it down. He said, no, I've got this old van I wanna give you. And finally, I, I just didn't know what to say, and I said, no, you keep that. And we walked away. Now, he, I know this man, th- kind of through mutual relationships, it broke that man. He had an opportunity to give, he felt like the Lord was calling him to give, and I'm the one who shot him down. And what I did was I robbed him of joy. And I could tell you the joy that he could have received in the gift was way more valuable than the vehicle he was about to give me. It, it, honestly, the kids were little, and I finally told them, that vehicle's too old, it's not safe for our kids. What a horrible thing for me to say. But my point is this. If God stirs your heart and you get saved and he begins to have joy welled up in you, there'll be a, an emotion that says, I just want to join the mission. And how dare us say, no, we don't need that. I don't want to interrupt that. It's a problem that we have, but it should be a desire that you have to want to join. Number two, as far as uh, setting goals, would be to be strategic. And what, but I, what I mean by that is to be proportional. Now, he says in verse 11, according to your means. And I think this is interesting because Paul is a Pharisee, which means he was an expert in the law. He does not here say, do what was commanded. He he doesn't mention a tithe, which in my, like I was raised where you tithed, right? Anybody amen to that? It was like 10%, this is what we need to do. It's interesting that Paul doesn't bring up the command. In fact, he says in verse eight, this is not a command. Then in verse 10, he says, I recommend. So why is that? Because I think what he's saying is what your motivation should be is not the letter of the law, but the spirit. I love one author, um, his name is Randy Alcorn. He said that tithing is like the training wheels on your bike. The bike wasn't meant to run with training wheels, but it's a good way to start. Instead, what you should do is be motivated by the grace. And what I would tell you is if you're a first time giver, if you're saying, you know what, we should start giving, what I would tell you is do a percent. Here's why, is because it forces you to think about what you have and then think about what you're giving. 
If it's just something that you can give and not think about, you've missed the point. But there's something about thinking about it, so do it proportionally, and it also allows you to grow and to say, you know what, I wanna get better. And well, how would you track that? I have to admit, this is not something that I've done because our church has been very blessed to have this online giving, and so I've kind of fixed it and forgot about it. So every month, twice a month, our gift comes out, and I don't think about it anymore, and that's not the heart of this. Is this making sense to everybody? So I would say give proportionally according to what you have. And the last thing I would tell you is this with it. I mean, there's a lot I could talk here, but set goals. What I would say is just do it, to use the Nike slogan. He says your willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. There's a saying, and I'm always a little hesitant to say it, but you've heard it before, and I think it's appropriate here. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. There are people that would sit in this very room that would say, one day I'll get saved. Can I tell you that sounds like somebody that's going to spend eternity in hell? Because the Bible doesn't talk about this one day. It says today's the day of salvation. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know the best day to start tithing is? It'd be today. You, you could plan and think, you know, can I tell you what most people do? And if this kind of gets up in your grill, I apology. Apology. Boy, I English as well. I speaky, whatever. <laughs> if this gets up in your grill, most people, and I was this way as a young believer, when we get this bill paid off, we're going to start tithing. We're going to start giving. Anybody else have that as a testament? As soon as we get these things under control, I'll start giving. And I can tell you that's a path that, that never has an end. Because there'll always be another surprise that came up. There'll always be another bill. There'll always be something that changes. If the Lord has called you to salvation and he saved not only your heart but your wallet, I'd say start giving. And maybe it's a small percent at first to say, you know, this is what we have, and, but at least you're thinking about it. Here's what I'd like to do, and you'd have some ambitious goals. Everybody with me say amen. Let's move on to the next point then. Here's the last thing, is to look at the God who gives. If you want to be great at giving, you, you should have somebody you're looking up to. You should set some ambitious goals for yourself. But the way he ends here in chapter 9, kind of jumping forward, is he looks at the God who gives. This is the God who, verse 8, provides seed for the sower. This is chapter 9, verse 8. Having all that you need, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed for the sower, it's good for us to remember that everything that you have is from the Lord. The breath that you have, that was from the Lord. The time that you have, that was from the Lord. And the finances that you have. Now, it was a little bit different whenever this was written because now we don't do like just common trading. It's all based on the U.S. dollar, right? It was a little bit different in this day when you brought your, your sheep to town and you're going to trade them for the flour and for the seeds and for this, right? So it, for them, this verse means a little bit more than maybe it does for us in our day and age. He supplies seed for the sower. He's given you everything that you need. We just sang this song. I remember hearing somebody say, it's as easy to sing a lie as it is to tell a lie. The, script, the song that we sang was, he's never failed me yet. In some ways, you're here as a testimony that God provided gas money for you today. Amen? And then also you see that this is the God that multiplies your harvest. He doesn't just supply the seed for it, but then he multiplies those seed. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. God created different laws that govern our world, like gravity, the law of motion. One of the laws that God created that we are kind of living under is that there's a law of the harvest. You always reap in proportion to what you sow. There's not a computer that's going to analyze this and be able to make it a formula, but I can tell you there's something about giving God, what, what he's laid on your heart, and he allows you to do more. I don't know how that formula works out, but God somehow in his timing that as we give, he begins to give more. I remember one author that says the problem with God is he's got a bigger shovel. And the more that we shovel to him, the more he shovels back to us. It's the principle that we talk about often as a church. He who's been faithful with a few things will be put char in charge of many. Now, I don't want to get into prosperity here, but there is a portion of that that is scriptural. When we give... He gives back. Proverbs eleven twenty four. One man gives freely and yet gains even more. Another withholds and comes to poverty. It's a law that the, the Lord has created for us to live by. Then he also multiplies our righteousness. Look at verse 10. Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase the store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. 
Could I tell you a really, really weird thing? As you give, you grow spiritually. Did, did that make sense? As you give, there's like a spiritual growth that happens with that. And remember the rich young ruler that comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And remember Jesus begins kind of giving him like maybe basic discipleship. Well, obey the law, honor your parents, do these, do that. And the guy says, I've done all those. Basically, he's saying, get to the end of the story. What's the last thing I have to do? And what's Jesus say? Oh, you want to jump to the end? Give up everything you have. There is something about when we give that helps us, you know, um, speed up the discipleship process. It makes us realize so much faster how God provides all of our needs, how he's always supplying, and how we cannot outgive him. Here's the last thing that happens is uh, that God, when you look to the God who gives, is your generosity multiplies other people's gratitude. There are people who begin to be, be thankful for what you've done. I know that I'm probably out of time, so let me move to our invitation and we'll close. Good question to start the sermon. What do you want to be the best at? I'd love to be the best basketball player. I don't have maybe the genetics for that. I, I used to have a friend that would say his problem in sports was that he never had a coach that understood his lack of size and ability. You know, like, yeah, that, that was me. You, you might not be able to be the best at some things, but do you know you could actually be the best at this? You, you could be the best giver. And I don't know if there'll ever be a day that God stands one of us up and says, this was the most generous person. But man, what a great ambition. Say, I, I want to be the most generous. I, I want this to be something the Lord is proud of. Let me just run back through our points and I'll close with one last story. Have you really given yourself to the Lord? Have you looked that Christ, although he was rich, made himself poor so that through his poverty we might become rich? Have you looked to the work of Christ? Have you given yourself to his work? What's your attitude while you give? Are you, are you joyful in it? Are you strategic in how you're giving? Have you made a plan of how you could give more? And I didn't even talk about this, but if it's not to this church, it's to the kingdom in some way, please don't think I'm asking for, for more here. It's just simply what scripture's called us to do. Are you looking at the example of Christ? Last story I'll share. There was a, a youth um, conference that a preacher was preaching at and had shared the gospel and talked about the great need for missions and for people to be sent and had really kind of whipped this crowd into a frenzy, an evangelistic frenzy, you could say. And he said this, he said, instead of closing the service with an invitation song and having the band come up and to play, I'd just like to read a song. And if this is your cry, almost like an invitation, I want you to respond with Amen. He read, began to read Francis Ridley uh, Havigal's song. Take my life, Lord, and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow with ceaseless praise. And the youth responded with an amen. He read the next verse. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful to thee. And they again applauded and yelled amen. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. At this point, the youth were standing as they said amen. And then he read the fourth verse. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou would choose. And the difference in the noise was staggering. Why is it that our money is always the last thing we want to give. When God changes a person, he changes all of them. And one of the things that he does is takes our selfishness and turns it into selflessness. I want to give for the glory of God. If God has spoken to you, I hope that you'd respond. I'm going to ask the band to come up and play. And I'd like to ask you, have you really given yourself to the Lord? Have you really given yourself to his work? Have you given your attitude? Are you given strategically? And are you looking at the example of Christ? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's your word that penetrates our heart. Father, I thank you for times that you've allowed me to preach. But ultimately, Lord, we know it's your spirit and your word that affects us. 
Father, would you allow your word not to return void today? Would you stir our hearts? For those who need to be saved, would you convict them of their sin, their need of a savior? And today, would they look to Christ and be saved? Father, for those that know you, but don't yet have the joy or the discipline of giving, Father, would your spirit lead them into that as well? Lord, we ask that you'd be honored. And Father, would you, would you create in us an ambition to be the best, to do our best for you? We love you, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.